today we are going to be going into a bit more detail on uh, a few topics, one, one of which actually was very briefly touched upon during the Monday lecture. So we're going to start uh, with an introduction and a check-in. And then after that, we're going to consider the topics of business as activism, art, spirituality, and self-expression. We're going to really explore today the why. Of course, this is a very practical class, right? Post-growth entrepreneurship. So this isn't a class in macroeconomics. It's also not a class in, in soft skills and purpose. That being said, uh, I do believe that uh, we need the why, <laughs> we need the context uh, before we can really make adequate use of some of the more practical skills uh, that we're going to be teaching you. So throughout the four weeks of the tutorial group, uh, what you can expect is that on week one, we are going to be spending a lot of time on this why. This, on weeks two and three, we're going to be diving into more practical work, and we're going to be considering things like business model canvases. So you are going to be designing a hypothetical business uh, following the, the post-growth uh, uh, mindset uh, in uh, creating a startup. And then also uh, on week four, we're going to be looking at shareholder engagement and concrete tools that one can use to actually change existing companies, large companies, publicly listed companies. So as you can see, we're going to be covering a wide breadth of different topics, but it's really going to start <laughs> with why. I mean, just as, as Simon Sinek uh, always says. So, but we're going to start uh, with... Uh, using Mentimeter. So I'm not sure if you all are familiar with Mentimeter, but we're going to have some interactivity in today's class, and this Mentimeter is going to be a large part of this. Bear in mind, uh, these answers are completely anonymous. So if you, you know, you don't need to hold back, you don't need to, uh, to, to, to lie or give answers that you think people expect you to give, uh, because there's no way that I can trace it back uh, to you guys. So I'm seeing an awful lot of yeses here. That's cool. I'm also seeing uh, some number of no's. Also, I don't know yet. All right. That's nice. So um, as you're going through this course, I hope that uh, if you do start a company or if you even if you don't want to start a company, but you someday reluctantly find yourself starting a company, which was kind of my situation, um, you know, I hope that uh, you'll be able to reflect on some of what we're teaching today, because we're going to be talking today a lot about how to make business personal to you. So the next uh, set of questions that I'm going to ask is, uh, what are your main interests when you're founding a startup? And there's four factors that I'm asking you to consider. Wealth creation, personal meaning, social status, and lifestyle design. And by lifestyle design, I mean sort of uh, escaping to, escaping the nine to five, that kind of thing. So just if from one to five, if you can uh, tell me the relative importance. And again, you don't need to just give an answer that you think people want to hear. <laughs> there is no wrong answer. But uh, I'm just asking uh, for you to self-reflect what uh, is most important to you. So I'll give you a minute. All right, so it looks like uh, wealth creation is in the lead. Personal meaning is very shortly after that. <laughs> Lifestyle design is a bit shorter after that and social status, not so much. So I guess you all don't care so much about, uh, about that one. All right, cool. So uh, this course is really gonna focus uh, today a lot on the, uh, on the personal meaning aspect. I mean, of course, in terms of wealth creation, you need to know how to run a solid business. <laughs> of course, uh, you know, no, no customers, no margin to, to reinvest, no business. But uh, at the same time though, today we're gonna focus on really how to make things customized for you. So we're gonna get started. And we're gonna start by reflecting in a bit more detail than on Monday about the concept of business as activism. So when we consider activism, of course, we're used to considering things like uh, you know, Greenpeace, 
<laughs> and Extinction Rebellion. And um, we're, we think about uh, protesting outside of corporate offices with, uh, with, with our, with our banners and, you know. But the thing is, with a lot of these kinds of activistic groups, uh, they tend to not have a business model. Yeah, not surprising, right? I mean, a lot of them are either donation uh, or subsidy funded. And also they uh, tend to rely upon volunteers. There's only one problem with this. The problem is that both volunteers as well as donations and subsidies are not reliable funding sources. And particularly in today's political climate, we can see that these funding sources oftentimes are drying up. <laughs> so um, what winds up happening though is sometimes NGOs want to harness something like business to create a sustainable long-term funding source uh, for their activism. Um, however, uh, there can be a problem with this. NGOs tend to fall into a situation that I call the subsidy trap. Now, the subsidy trap is very similar to the poverty trap. So I'm sure you're familiar with the term the poverty trap. Sometimes you have a poor person uh, who is on uh, state welfare. Now, they want to do something to improve their lives. So they might want to get a job or they might want to start a business. But the problem is that the moment that they take these actions to make their lives better, they lose their subsidy. So, or I should say their, their welfare. So they are caught between this rock and this hard place that they can't really go in either direction because the system is kind of holding them there. Now, NGOs actually have the same struggle uh, with, uh, with subsidies. Um, and what happens is if you're an NGO, um, most of the time, uh, if you're receiving donations, you are registered with the tax authorities as charitable which basically means that when people make donations, those donations are tax deductible. Now, the problem is the moment that that NGO starts acting too much like a business, uh, you know, the uh, tax authorities then can, you know, they, they can say, well, that that's not how it's supposed to be. And they can actually revoke the NGO's charitable status. Now, this, of course, is a life and death situation for most uh, NGOs and nonprofits, because, of course, the moment they lose that charitable status, then, of course, uh, the donations are no longer tax deductible, which means the donations may dry up. So, again, they're caught between this rock and this hard place of creating a sustainable business model using business versus remaining dependent and reliant upon external third party subsidies and donations basically forever. You know, and this is a really large problem. Uh, and it's not just nonprofits and NGOs who fall into this subsidy trap. Uh, we also have this with, you know, th things like uh, creative artists, <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, let's say like, you have a musician or a painter, they might be receiving cultural subsidies. And of course, the moment that they want to start a business so they can actually be able to earn a living without having to, you know, clean houses and, you know, wait tables at a restaurant on the side, you know, uh, of course, then they're also at risk of losing their cultural subsidies with the irony that at the moment that a artist becomes too financially successful, not only do they lose their funding sources, but oftentimes they lose their friends as well. It's a very strange situation. Um, but anyhow, uh, but the point is, though, that uh, business is actually a really powerful tool for change. You know, and if you think about the concept of fair trade, you know, with fair trade, you're basically enabling uh, consumers uh, to be able to choose the world that they want to live in with their euros, right? You know, each euro is giving them a vote. Um, the great thing also is that uh, you can also do business to business fair trade. And of course, businesses have far more euros to spend uh, than most consumers do. <laughs> uh, and this is actually a really powerful tool because when you put a non-commercial entity onto the commercial market, the truth is that all of a sudden, the commercial incumbents have to compete with you. And that's actually very difficult because ethics has market value. <laughs> uh, for example, um, if you uh, are a social enterprise 
And I can get, yeah, I can use my own company, Radically Open Security, as an example. Um, I started Radically Open Security because I wasn't happy with the ethics uh, of a lot of the commercial security companies uh, in the Netherlands, but also globally. Um, the, you know, they're doing things like hacking activists, um, selling surveillance systems to developing worlds. And, you know, if you stop them, ask them to stop doing this, do they stop? No, they just sell that part of the company. You know, there, there's just cyber warfare. There's a lot of really weird things going on. And if it's not that, it's things like just being so incredibly commercial that it's not even useful. So I started Radically Open Security as a nonprofit, basically a foundation-owned company that gives all of its non-reinvested profits to charity precisely because I wanted to separate profit motive from the actual operational vehicle of the business with the idea that if you can eliminate the extractive profit motive, all that's left is meaning. All that's left is having a vehicle of, with people working together to make the world better. And that's activism. <laughs> and the funny thing is that having put this onto the commercial market, uh, three years after we had entered the market, the market leader at the time in the Netherlands introduced an ethics policy. <laughs> you know, there was never any talk of ethics uh, beforehand. Of course, we can also debate, you know, how genuine was this ethics policy? You know, was this just greenwashing? But nonetheless, it really shows that being there, uh, you know, really creates discussions and also can have an internal impact. Because what you're doing, if you go to a company like Shell, right? Uh, or BP, and you say, I don't like what you're doing, right? You know, you're, you're harming the planet. They, they might listen or not. <laughs> you know, we, when we're just talking to companies, it doesn't really, you know, it's really hard to actually get them to listen. But the way to consistently get them to listen is to have them feel it in their pocketbook, <laughs> you know, because the moment that uh, they feel it in their pocketbook, uh, then they are, um, that's the moment that they're listening because it's affecting their bottom line. <laughs> so, um, and the thing is running an ethical non-commercial business on the commercial market, they are competing with you for market share. They are also competing with you for staff <laughs> because, you know, if you think about it logically, you know, I, with my company, we're working specifically with uh, computer hackers. That's, that's the business that I'm in. But uh, if you can do the same work for the same billable rates, <laughs> you know, uh, but be able to do it for a company that is, you know, emphasizes openness, transparency, education, and that you know they're giving all their non-reinvested profits to charity, would you rather work for them or would you rather work for a large commercial company? It's a no-brainer, actually, if the pay is, is quite similar. So that's the thing. Uh, this is actually a way to really be able to start to infiltrate uh, the power structures and get the companies to listen in a way that's really hard to do if you're not a business person yourself. So um, we're going to go on uh, then to the next uh, Mentimeter exercise. And the next question that I'm going to be asking is, what would business as activism look like for you? You know? And of course, the form of activism is, is going to be something intensely personal. What I do for activism won't be what you do. So I'm curious to see some answers. Hmm. I'm seeing an interesting uh, variety of, uh, of answers. So some of the answers here are really focusing on uh, making an impact. So in other words, things like a communication making an impact, environmental activism, fairness, sustainability, but I'm also helping society, but I'm also seeing a different uh, category of answers, um, which are really quite interesting, aggressive, unprofitable, <laughs> underrated. Um, we're saying here, unprofitable, underperforming, underrated. Now, the funny thing is um, none of that actually is true. Because uh, if you're not running a profitable business, first of all, the business isn't going to survive in the first place, and then you don't have a business. <laughs> Social enterprises by no means are unprofitable. See, there is a misconception that anything that is ethical or socially responsible is somehow automatically less 
profitable, you know, less, uh, that it's not going to perform as well. It's, it's like, it's some kind of competitive disadvantage on the market, but truthfully speaking, as I said, ethics has market value. And that actually also is powerful marketing. It's part of why commercial companies do greenwash. They wouldn't be greenwashing if it wasn't effective. So, I mean, ethics does have market value. The other thing also is that the irony is that actually the commercial companies most of the time are far less profitable. I can give you two reasons for that. One is because most, uh, uh, well, commercial companies are funded by external capital, most of the time, things like VC. And uh, because they get such a huge cash infusion, most of the time, actually, they're, they're burning through cash and they're very deeply in the red. So the, whereas with social enterprises and particularly ones that we're bootstrapping where we're not ex accepting external VC, uh, then we actually need to have a far more solid value proposition and business model in order to survive. So the grand irony then is that um, most of the time, these kinds of non-funded social enterprises are actually going to be more profitable, <laughs> um, ironically enough. Um, the other thing also is that with commercial companies, oftentimes you're extracting the financial value out of the company. And the more cash you extract out of the company, the less cash you have left over to actually run a good business. So, you know, money that's dividended out for shareholders is money that you're not using for R&D, for making better products and services, for paying your staff better, for lowering prices, you know, for, for customers, uh, for quality assurance. So the irony then also is that extractive businesses, um, you know, which many of them are, even if they do have CSR, you know, uh, initiatives where they are saying that they're sustainable, but still, if there's cash leaking out of the company, this too is a competitive disadvantage on the market. But most people don't think about it this way. And th that's also part of the purpose of this class, to really attend you to the fact that a lot of what you think is common sense <laughs> isn't always true. Being extractive and exploitative doesn't always make for better business. We're told this because, you know, it's it's being used to justify extractive harmful business practices, but it does not have to be this way. And oftentimes it's not this way. And this is a misconception. And it's part of what I hope that you, in the course of also taking this course, that you can unlearn because before you can learn how to do things differently, first, you need to unlearn a lot of, um, again, the quote unquote common sense and things that we accept as being true when they actually don't stand up to scrutiny when you look at them closely. Anyway, uh, we're going to move on uh, to the next slide. And the next slide is business as art. Now, I can already, uh, you know, feel some eyes rolling <laughs> when I cover uh, cover top co topics like this, because uh, of course, uh, then we're always thinking, yeah, okay, art, who cares? I mean, you know, we're business students. Why is this even relevant? And anyway, this whole thing is like really, you know, um, woo woo. But, but look, hear me out here. <laughs> um, you can use business as a mixed media, media for art. Now, what is art actually at its fundament? I mean, art oftentimes is just a method of communicating somehow using something in a way that you're trying to get people to think and you're trying to get people to see the world in a different way, differently <laughs> uh, than they had thought about the world before they encountered whatever art uh, that you're putting out there. And who's to say you can't use business as a media for art? Of course, some people find this ridiculous, and they might also even find it offensive. If you go to an artist and you say to the artist, I'm using business, I'm a business artist, I'm using business as a mixed media for art, then they're just going to laugh at you. And they're going to be like, yeah, right. Uh, you know, and on top of that, they might get offended and say, you know, business, no, man, business is evil. <laughs> like there's absolutely, there couldn't be anything that's further away from art than business. But the funny thing is, if you take that tension that people feel uh, about business and art and, or business being art, and then you pay attention and feel that tension, that is actually precisely what you can make the art with, right? You know, and the thing is that viewing it in this way can open up some new pathways for you as an entrepreneur. 
ask yourself the question, what would it look like if I created an avant-garde business? See, when you think about avant-garde, you're thinking about things like uh, Marcel Duchamp and his urinal, right? I mean, things that are completely ridiculous, offensive, absurdist, inefficient, useless, right? But maybe actually sometimes incorporating some of that can actually be a good thing. <laughs> See, here's the thing. As, as business people, we are used to being efficient. We're used to optimizing for efficiency, right? You know, this is why we're taking classes on things like operations and logistics and supply chain. It's because we're trying to take all the friction out of the system to get things to move as efficiently as possible. However, we have to also keep in mind that efficiency oftentimes removes the humanity from a business. <laughs> You know, it's like in the healthcare sector, right? I mean, when you take healthcare practitioners and patients and you start treating them both like, like numbers and trying to shave the number of minutes that you're spending, you know, off of, uh, you know, uh, you know, between whether it's, it's a nurse having to drive somewhere quickly or just the amount, very small amount of time you're spending with the patients, is this really helping your business? <laughs> you know, I mean, Birzorg is a really great example of a company that do, does things differently, you know, and they give all of the uh, nurses time to do things like have a cup of coffee, right, uh, with the patients and to actually treat them like humans. You know, they also take the management out of the middle. They're hierarchically organized. That's a topic I'll discuss in a later lecture. But the long and the short is by the fact that they actually took the efficiency out of their business, they became the largest home health care provider in the Netherlands. It actually sometimes turns out that, that being less efficient can actually help you uh, to create a product and a service that people just plain like better, and that has better product market fit. So the thing is, you know, with art, uh, oftentimes art is the act of being playful. You know, just have fun with things. Think about how can I create a business that is so inefficient? It's like a Rube Goldberg machine with all these different pieces. And it's just a bit silly, but, but it still has a business model and it can still support its own costs. See, who's to say you can't set things up that way? Why shouldn't you? I mean, I can remember one time early on, uh, I had some, uh, some technical writers in my company um, uh, and we had delivered a quotation for a security audit and we wrote up the quotation uh, in science fiction style just for fun. We basically turned it into a, probably a, a couple page uh, sci-fi story. The funny thing was uh, the customer loved it. <laughs> we got the job, <laughs> you know, and I just so happened with the technical writers. I mean, one of them basically wrote, um, you know, a fantasy and steampunk and punk in her free time <laughs> and she had the skills. So it was just sort of like, yeah, why not? And that's just kind of the thing. It's like, yeah, why not? I mean, it's also what Google used to be when they first started, right? I mean, having the chef of the Grateful Dead. I mean, also having all the all the you know uh, uh, all those perks back in the days when that really wasn't a thing. See, the funny thing is, you know, actually looking at things in a way where you're just trying to be weird and different can, ironically enough, also help your company to be more successful. <laughs> you know, and we're not used to thinking about this. The other thing also is that uh, when we're talking about art, uh, we're also talking here about creativity. So really, you know, what's happening here is that uh, there's a really great TED Talk. It's actually the most watched TED Talk of all time, and it's by Sir Ken Robinson. And it is actually about uh, education. <laughs> and it's about how in school, particularly when you're in primary school, Students tend to be divided up into different streams, right? You know, I mean, it's determined at a very early age that this student is going to go in this direction. So perhaps this student is going to study the arts. That student is going to st study uh, science. Uh, this st student is, is going to study business. Or at you know at or at most, you're, we're going to be dividing the students into like you're a creative and you're a rationalist, right? And then once we get into these educational streams, it's extremely difficult to get out of them again. <laughs> now we have this in the Netherlands, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, students are put into educational tracks at a very early age. And once you're in them, it's very difficult to get out of them again. 
Now, but the real question is, is this helpful? Like, should we be siloed and divided up at an early age into creatives and rationalists? <laughs> you know, because the thing is, we actually need both sides, <laughs> you know, because each of us is both creative and rational. It's not one or the other. It's both, <laughs> right? You know, and what Sir Ken Robinson says in his TED Talk is that how can you expect to create if you're not creative? You know, and this applies equally to IT people, to, to business people, you know? I mean, because we're so used to just focusing on the tools, you know, that we need to, to create something without really asking the question of, of why or, or what's, the, what's the meaning of all this? And does this even fit me or does it suit me? You know, I used to be an assistant professor of computer science at the Freiheitsstadt, uh, the Free University of Amsterdam, and um, you know, I was dealing with computer science students. So, of course, in the curriculum, we had all kinds of classes on, you know, uh, computer systems, on networking, operating systems, programming languages, uh, you know, frameworks, cybersecurity. You know, really the hard technical classes. But the problem here was that the definition of success of most of these students when they graduate was to get a job at Google or Facebook or Amazon, <laughs> you know? I mean, and of course, once they actually get out there and they get these jobs, you know, it's gonna be exciting the first few years when you're a recent graduate. But look, I personally am 44 years old. So, you know, I'm, I'm a mid career professional. I am middle-aged, right? And uh, a lot of people my age who do work for these kinds of corporations get burned out. I have friends who have left the cybersecurity field completely because they were so disgusted by the way that the companies were behaving. They said, I don't want to be, I don't want to be part of this anymore. Right. You know, and then at mid career, then finally at that point, they're like, yeah. And now, you know, I'm going to do things differently. <laughs> right. So, so here's the thing. I mean, also, even when you're students, you need to understand that when you graduate, you also are going to have choices and you can either support the status quo with your time and your energy and your talents, or you can do something like joining a transformative nonprofit social enterprise startup and then use those same skills and further develop those same skills in a way that you are making the world better. The choice is yours, right? <laughs> you know, and it's not to say that you also can't earn decent money and a decent salary and a decent living working for a socially responsible business either. I mean, I'm also earning a decent salary, of course, for the cybersecurity work that I'm doing with Radically Open Security. But the point is that this whole line of questioning is not part of our education. It's the same thing also with uh, incubators, right? I mean, as, as, as technical people or scientists or just business people, we're used to getting free incubation. So with the University of Amsterdam, if you want to start a startup, you'll probably go to, to the Amsterdam Center for Entrepreneurship, ACE. Uh, that's located in Science Park. And you'll you'll get some really wonderful supportive services <laughs> uh, to help you create your company. Uh, you know, Radically Open Security was incubated at ACE, right? You know, because I was a former faculty member at the, uh, at the FU. So, you know, I also went through that ecosystem and it's great, you know, and we get this for free. But, but then again, we're sort of in that rationalist silo. <laughs> now we can ask ourselves the question, that's awesome. So what about the creative artists, right? Because we've also got art schools here in Amsterdam. We've got uh, the, the Rietveld Academy. We've got the uh, music conservatory. So where's the incubation services for them? Hmm. There aren't any. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of funny. And, you know, maybe also if there are any incubation services at all, they tend to not be subsidized at all by the government, which basically means that the full cost of the program then would also be going directly onto those same creative artists who are the people who are the least likely to even be able to afford such a program. It makes no sense. 
you know, but the problem here then is you've got two people on two different sides of the chasm, <laughs> kind of looking at each other suspiciously, <laughs> you know, and you've got the artists looking at the business people saying, man, those people in suits just ruining the world. And then you've got the, uh, the, the rationalists on the other side, looking at the creative artists and saying, man, they're just lazy and they just want to live off of subsidy and, and do their hobbies all day, you know, but truthfully speaking, if you take these two groups and you bring them together, so you break through the silos and you bring the different groups of people together, magic happens, <laughs> right? You know, in nonprofit ventures, my incubator that I've run now for a third year, we've incubated almost 50 startups. I make sure to incorporate at least one creative artist in every cohort. So in the very first cohort, uh, we had a, a mixed media artist, uh, Anu Cleon. Actually, you can see one of uh, her works uh, behind me uh, in the video. She's really amazing. Uh, and in our second cohort, uh, we also had a classical pianist, <laughs> right? So, I mean, this is definitely not the kinds of people that most of us are used to hanging out with. Now, the funny thing was that if I think back to, for example, our physical startup boot camp that we had the first year in Terschelling, there were moments of absolute sublime, you know, uh, discussion going on. You know, the business school professor and the mixed media artist, they were just like each other's favorite people, <laughs> you know, because the thing was, it, they had contact with people they were not used to talking with. <laughs> and, you know, the, the artist helped the business school professor to see things in a completely different way. And the business school professor also helped the creative artist to see things in a completely different way. So then let me ask the question. I mean, what happens if you take, for example, a Amsterdam Center for Entrepreneurship and, and an incubator, like a startup village? And then what would happen if you combined that with something like an artist atelier? you know, of the kind that we have in the former squats. I mean, things like uh, the Okta building or uh, the former ADM, right? <laughs> what if you just took those two groups and you put them together in the same building? What would happen? <laughs> yeah, you just might find that the rationalists have the practical tools and can offer support to the creative artists in building their businesses. And then those creative artists can then help us <laughs> rationalists with remembering why we're doing all of this in the first place. Right. And it's not just the silos between people that we can work on addressing, but it's also that that division within ourselves. We too can consider ourselves to be creative artists, but we're not used to thinking of things this way. Uh, science fiction is activism because it's imagining the world to come. Think about how to apply that to starting a business. So look, uh, there is a really amazing book that's called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. So Julia Cameron writes this book for what she calls blocked artists. What does that mean, right? What's a blocked artist? Well, what it basically is, is someone who has some form of artistic interest. It could very well be that maybe when we were younger, maybe we used to, to draw or we used to play music, or maybe it was just even things like just taking long walks outside. You know, there was some kind of practice or art that we used to do, but at a certain point in life, you know, we just stopped doing it, right? You know, we got caught up in practical issues, things like school, jobs, you know, obligations, raising families, you know, the different kinds of things that just, you know, we're basically too busy adulting, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, through that adulting, at a certain point, we bury that part of ourself, that, that inner child, you know, that, that wants to play, that wants to create that art, that wants to take those photos or make those videos or pr practice whatever form, you know, of art that speaks to us and that makes us feel alive. That's a blocked artist. And that's basically all of us. <laughs> now, the problem here is, is that when you get blocked, your creativity also gets blocked, which basically means that uh, you're going to be doing things that you think other people expect you to do rather than doing things that actually really have any form of meaning for you. And here's the thing. I mean, most people are going to build businesses based on other people's ideas 
you know, the, the, the one pr- common failure scenario actually for, for startups is having aspiring founders go to a pitch competition, <laughs> right? And then they'll wind up, they'll be in groups and then that pitch competition will have a particular theme and then they'll come up with something in however many hours, you know, to, uh, to be able to pitch to the judges. If they win the pinch pitch competition, then what happens is they get some, uh, you know, some money to actually be able to uh, do the startup. And then amazingly enough, that's their startup, right? But did this startup actually fit the person? <laughs> you know, I mean, was this actually something they wanted or was it just something that the judges wanted? I mean, it's actually a really bizarre way of coming up with a topic for a startup, if you ask me. <laughs> Right. And the problem then is if it's not something that's really deeply, intensely personal for you, then when the going gets tough, as it usually does, you know, when you're running a business, you're going to (laughs) quit, you know, because it takes a lot of persistence to really be able to see companies through. (laughs) So, you know, and and that's the reason why we have to unblock. That's the reason why we need to um, really try and figure out what are those undercurrents in our subconscious that are really telling us, you know, there is a reason why I'm here. There's a purpose why I'm here. I was put on this planet for some reason that, you know, I need to figure this out, right? So the next topic that we're going to cover is the topic of business as spirituality. Now, of course, this is another one of these things that, again, I'm hearing eyes eyes rolling here. (laughs) But again, you know, hear me out here. So the concept of business, as well as economics and finance, has surprising appearances in almost every single major world religion, (laughs) Uh, not to mention also uh, in generic spirituality as such. So I'm going to illustrate it uh, by first looking at uh, Eastern religions, things like Buddhism and Taoism. So um, the first thing, in Buddhism, there are eight noble uh, paths. So basically, and and one of them is called right livelihood. So in other words, uh, the way that you earn your money, your gainful employment, this is actually, believe it or not, one of their noble eightfold paths, you know, that they uh, want to get right uh, in order to, well, be a good Buddhist, I guess. Uh, So, you know, and there's a lot of concepts also from Buddhism that have surprising practical applications in business and entrepreneurship. One particular one is... uh, mindfulness and meditation, you know, this shouldn't be too surprising because of course you see um, companies like Google, you know, starting to bring in uh, mindfulness meditation coaches and things like this. But of course you also need to take that with a, uh, with a grain of salt, because of course uh, there's also a really excellent book that's called Mick Mindfulness (laughs) that uh, looks at um, yeah, how mindfulness has gotten westernized and actually how it's sometimes being abused. For example, teaching mindfulness to the Department of Defense so that uh, they're more able to let go and commit atrocities, obviously. That is is not the point uh, of uh, mindfulness and meditation. But the whole idea, though, is as a leader, it's really easy to get invested in what's happening with our company, right? (laughs) You know, and particularly when things aren't going uh, the way that we want them to be going, uh, it's particularly easy to um, just get really wound up (laughs) and really desiring something. And sometimes, ironically enough, the more we want something, the less likely it is to happen, or the harder we push for something, you know, the more that we actually push away that which we uh, that which we want. Also, just the whole feeling of groundlessness, of not always being in control of things. We're not always in control of things, and then being able to accept that. And the other thing also is, as a leader, sometimes precisely the qualities that make us want to be leaders in the first place are the same qualities that make us really bad leaders. (laughs) In other words, things like, uh, you know, too much self-confidence, too aggressive communications. Um, You know, I mean, we only have to look look further, no further than Elon Musk, for example, to to sort of understand 
uh, how this can work and what kinds of business implications that this can have practically. But it happens to everyone. It happens to me as well. You know, I'll just have a bad day. I'll wake up on the wrong side of the be bed and I will just say something to somebody that I shouldn't have said. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just be in a bad mood and just be more short with somebody than I should have been. And the problem is when you're the CEO, this causes problems. <laughs> you know, it's bad for morale. It drops productivity of your team. If they don't feel comfortable, you know, if people don't feel safe emotionally, then they're also not going to contribute things. And they're also not going to give you criticism. You know, they'll, you'll, you'll start building a culture of yes men because people will be afraid to actually be able to say what's wrong, which means that you won't be able to make meaningful changes in your company. Believe it or not, this stuff actually matters. You know, and look, I'm a techie, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm a cybersecurity professional. That's what I do. And for me, like as a typical techie, empathy is hard. <laughs> I'll tell you it is, you know, as sort of an incredibly stereotypical, semi-autistic, you know, computer scientist, you know, who's very comfortable with, with technology and with details. From, from my point of view, technology is easy. People are hard. You know, <laughs> but nine times out of 10, when things go wrong, it goes wrong because of how we're dealing with people. And sometimes, ironically enough, just being able to read one of these Buddhist books, you know, something from Pema Chodron or Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, just something that helps you to sort of understand that you need to stop grasping, stop wanting and start accepting. Sometimes that can actually be the absolute best thing for your business, strangely enough. Um, Taoism is also another very interesting uh, religion. Well, if, if you would even uh, necessarily call it a religion, because uh, it, it's actually really just a, a group of uh, poetic verses uh, from Lao Tzu. So basically, uh, there's a lot of very interesting things in the Tao Te Ching. And many of them are contradicting. <laughs> and that's actually one of the really beautiful things uh, about uh, the Tao Te Ching. Uh, you can see the quote on the slide uh, here. Um, a leader is best when the people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. You know? It's really showing that, you know, sometimes it's just best, best to let go, <laughs> to step back, to stop controlling, right? <laughs> you know, and this is not usually what we learn in leadership classes <laughs> of the kind that we would get from incubators and business schools, you know, but it's, it's good to wrap our minds around the fact that there's two sides of things. And sometimes with those two sides, both of those things can actually be true at the same time. Just the opening quote from the Tao Te Ching uh, already gets that point across. The Tao does nothing, but leaves nothing undone. If powerful men could center themselves in it, the whole world would be transformed by itself. That whole concept is called Wu Wei, the, the, the non-doing, you know? And that's not a concept that we're used to learning in business school, right? Uh, another really great quote from the Tao. If you don't trust the people, you make them untrustworthy. Truth. Another one that's kind of interesting. Clay is molded into a vessel. It is the empty space that gives the function of the vessel. That says a lot about leadership, right? Now, there's a book uh, that's called The Tao of Leadership by John Hyder. You can see it here on the slide. And what it does is it actually takes all 81 verses of the Tao Te Ching and it translates them directly into business leadership um, tips. So I would highly recommend the book. So um, also, if you look at the Semitic religions, so we all know that there's three major world religions, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. The interesting thing about these religions is they have a surprising amount to say about business and again, and economics and finance. And uh, it covers, you know, it starts off by covering topics, things like fairness of weights and measures, tithing, land usage, compensation. It covers things like um, debt jubilees, <laughs> right? You know, uh, debt relief. And, uh, but, but the number one most popular topic <laughs> across those three major world religions is what's called usury. 
So usury is basically using money to breed more money, right? <laughs> and uh, often, most often it takes the form of interest-bearing loans. So uh, we're going to start uh, with um, Judaism, okay? So uh, I'm going to give you some quotes, uh, basically, from the, uh, from the Bible, from the Old Testament, and uh, you'll, you'll see, actually, how it is directly addressing these kinds of issues. For example, in Exodus 22, 24, if thou lend money to any of my people, even to the poor upon thee, thou shalt not beat to him as a creditor, neither shall ye lay upon him interest. <laughs> really, it's talking about interest. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're not used to thinking about business, you know, for, from these kinds of sources. And by the way, another thing I want to say, I don't mean to be promoting any one religion or another here. I'm just comparatively looking across a broad range of religions. I have no opinion really about uh, what religion you should have, or even if you should have any religion at all, right? Um, also looking at uh, Christianity, for example, <laughs> um, you... So first of all, the Christian Bible uh, says the love of money is the root of all evil. That's pretty clear. You know? Also in Luke 6.35, Jesus appeals to his followers to lend expecting nothing in return. Right? And probably some of us are also familiar with the parable of uh, Jesus and the money lenders when basically there were money lenders in the temple district who were practicing usury. They were busy using money to breed more money. And Jesus got so angry at them for uh, you know practicing this root of all evil, he threw them out of the temple district, right? <laughs> you know. So another thing also kind of funny, uh, in uh, Dante's in Inferno, he actually places the usurers in the seventh circle of hell in Canto 17. You know, a bit, yeah, a bit different, right? But uh, we're, we're typically not used to thinking of this as, as a spiritual issue. So another thing also is that actually going back to uh, Islam, Islam also has some really interesting things to say about usury. So interest-bearing loans and usury is also forbidden in the Quran. And what's interesting is there's many Islamic countries in which modern banks uh, perform what they call Islamic banking. <laughs> and that is either interest-free uh, or very, very low interest rate banking. And they do this because um, it is um, yeah, in, in line with their, their religious values. Yeah. <laughs> So um, another person who has gotten in on the action is Pope Francis, of all people, <laughs> right? So Pope Francis uh, wrote an encyclical back in 2015 that was called Laudato Si, that was about economic growth and climate change. And as you can see on the slide, a, a particular quote from him the principle of the maximization of profits frequently isolated from other considerations reflects a misunderstanding of the very concept of the economy. Pope Francis is writing about economics. You know, we're not used to thinking of this as a spiritual or religious issue, but very clearly some of the, the leaders of the church believe that this is an extremely relevant topic. So in October of 2020, Pope Francis also wrote a second encyclical called Fratelli Tutti, uh, in which he goes on to provide more comments about trickle-down economics and, uh, and also in the re relation to the pandemic. Um, and his followers actually call his economic vision the economy of Francesco. It's very interesting. Uh, and like I said, regardless of whether you're Christian or not, I personally am not, doesn't matter. But the point is that uh, it's interesting to Google uh, because th these are precisely the kinds of topics that can bring together the kinds of people who don't usually agree with one another. So uh, of course, all this religion, it didn't develop in a vacuum. <laughs> you know, modern religions uh, often you know, oftentimes had their roots in ancient Greece and Rome. So, uh, for example, uh, you, we had uh, Aristotle in Greece, and he called usury the most unnatural and unjust of all trades. 
He said, money is to be used for exchange, not the breeding of money from money. And in Rome, Cicero, Cato, and Seneca made similar noises. This leads us to really quite interesting philosophical discussions, like what then is breeding money from money? I mean, you know, you find out that actually quite a large part of our economy and how we do business revolves around it. I mean, is usury just interest-bearing loans, or does it also include, for example, leveraging our possessions uh, to make money from those who have less than us, right? I mean, what's the difference between Jesus's proverbial moneylender and a landlord, <laughs> right? Uh, or a banker or a fund manager, you know? And can we actually find ways to, to reconcile <laughs> those occupations with, uh, you know, not having financial extraction <laughs> from the whole process? You know, these are all things that we can think about. So, all right, uh, we're going to go to the next uh, Mentimeter. I'm just going to ask here, uh, could you reconcile business and spirituality? Or is this too offensive to you, right? And if you could, how? So just think about it. This isn't an easy question, but uh, write down some answers. Yeah, uncertain. This is a hard question, you know? And it's not the kind of question that you can also answer in five minutes, right? Or, or even you know, the 60 seconds that I'm giving you for this Mentimeter. The whole point here is, I mean, to really think about how you can apply these things to yourselves. And it's not just a decision, <laughs> you know, it's not just uh, coming up with an answer, but it's, it's a process and it's a long-term process. So yeah, interesting answers here. Controversial, definitely. Not sure, uncertain. Used as a tool to bring people together. If you're a workaholic, it works. All right. All right. So um, thanks then, I guess, uh, for the answers. So I, I prefer we should focus more on the business side. Religion should be a personal thing. That reminds me actually of a time when I was at uh, the Copan uh, Monastery. I was actually visiting for about a week. It was in uh, Kathmandu in Nepal. So it was just, just outside of Kathmandu in the mountains. And I remember meeting a woman there who was studying in this annual program that they have. And uh, she worked in Silicon Valley for Facebook. And I can remember her saying to me, you know, I wish I could figure out some way to reconcile my working with Facebook with my Buddhist spiritual practice. You know, and in the end, sort of the only this the the only solution she was able to find was to uh, separate them completely. But of course, if we do separate them completely, I mean, this is a tragedy, actually, you know. So, but, but again, it's not an easy thing and moving forward, I mean, we need to think for ourselves how we can make such, uh, such applications. So, all right, um, we're going to move on to the next one, uh, actually the last one, <laughs> and this is business as a form of self-expression. And we're going to start by considering what's called the hero's journey. It's also called the monomyth. It is a 12-step template by Joseph Campbell that is very frequently used in theater productions and literature. <laughs> so in other words, uh, if you take uh, your typical action adventure story, something like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, or, you know, typically what you have is you have some kind of a hero, and then that hero has a call to adventure, right? And then at a certain point, they're like, well, actually, I don't want to go on an adventure. I'm pretty comfortable where I'm at now. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> and uh, but then at that point, you know, and they refuse the call, but then something else happens. You know, sometimes a mentor appears who helps them to get them sort of over the, the boundary. And then they decide to go on that adventure. And then once they're on the adventure, then they'll have some obstacles, which they then need to overcome. And of course, in the end, there's usually a battle. And in the end, they win and then they return back home again at the end being some kind of a transformed person. I mean, this is 
basically the, uh, the, the, the gen generic template of the hero's journey. But the question I think here is, how can we apply this to ourselves as entrepreneurs? Think about it this way. If there was a theater production about our lives and our businesses, and if we could write the script to that show <laughs> through our actions, not our words, but our actions, what would that story be like? And can we create dramatic unity between our North Star of purpose and our everyday boring operational decisions and, and little everyday details that we need to take care of? Can we get them aligned? How can we get them aligned? And in the end, when people look at our company, what kind of a story was this, right? You know, was it just a story uh, in which someone was greedy and got rich and that was sort of it and, you know, and, and a lot of people were harmed? Or is this instead some kind of a noble quest? And that's the thing. We need to think about our businesses, you know, and our startups, if we're creating them, as being our way to leave our legacy, you know? I know that most of you are young. <laughs> Again, you know, I'm middle-aged myself, but look, when, when you get to my age, you're going to realize that money is not the scarce commodity. Time is, <laughs> you know, you can always get more money. You can't get more time, you know, and people have different ways of leaving their legacy. Some people, they have kids, you know, and that's, uh, that's sort of how they want to do it. You know, other people think, okay, well, I'll earn a whole, a whole lot of money and maybe leave it to somebody. I mean, you can do that too. But the point is that, uh, you know, what we're doing in our world today, this is what we're creating. And this is also what we're leaving behind. And look, as for me, for example, for, as a 44 year old female, you know, I, I don't have kids. This is by choice. You know, I'm running a business. I've got 50 <laughs> staff members, which are, they might as well be kids, you know? So uh, I, I've got my hands full. Uh, I do have a cat, not the same thing, but look, the point is that um, because I don't have kids, it basically means I do need to leave my impact on this world in some other way. And the way that I'm doing this is through my company. It is through, you know, like radically open security, the, the, the activism that we're doing, the fact that I can help all kinds of nonprofits and NGOs uh, you know, at, at, on a nonprofit basis. I mean, that kind of stuff has impact, not to mention also with, uh, you know, post-growth entrepreneurship and what I'm teaching to you guys, you know, this is also impact, right? This is a legacy. If you guys can even take a fraction of what I'm saying and integrate this into your lives and move forward with it, what more legacy could I possibly ask for? Right? So, you know, the same thing applies to you. I mean, it's choices to be made. And uh, the final thing that I want to cover with uh, business as self-expression is the whole idea of synchronicity and scavenger hunts. So look, with business, I mean, your first customer most of the time is probably going to be the cousin of the uncle of the neighbor of that guy you met one time at that party right? I mean, that's just always how it happens. We can call it good luck. <laughs> you know, we can call it coincidence. Uh, but in general, it, it, we can also call it synchronicity. So it's the kinds of things in the universe that just sort of line up for you. And one thing leads to another thing, and you couldn't have really planned it, but it just sort of happened that way. <laughs> and part of, with entrepreneurship, part of it is really just trying to create those kinds of opportunities so you can get lucky, <laughs> you know, create those empty spaces so you can have synchronicity. And a frequently occurring scenario for people who want to start a business is that they don't, you know, they want to start a business, but they don't really know what to do. <laughs> like they don't have a business idea and they're like, yeah, I'd love to start a business, but what topic? I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? And then they figure, well, you know, maybe if I just wait long enough, something will come to me, right? Because, I mean, hey, after all, if business is a form of spirituality, then, yeah, I mean, at some point, a burning bush is going to come down and say, thou shalt create this business, right? <laughs> I mean, sadly, that's not how it works. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you do have to spend some time looking for it, but sometimes, actually, you can, ironically enough, look 
more effectively by not looking. <laughs> so let me explain what I mean by that. Most of the time, if you want to find some thing, you know, whether it's meaning or pur your purpose in life or just your business idea, whatever it happens to be doing, but you know that what you're doing now isn't it, the very first thing that you need to do is you need to get quiet. You basically need to create some space in your life in which you're not doing anything at all. Now, this is really counterintuitive to most of us, you know, A-type <laughs> business people or aspiring business people. We think we have to keep busy all the time, right? And we think that uh, keeping busy is even a virtue because if people ask, how you doing? You're like, yeah, oh, man, I'm so busy. I'm doing this, that, and wow. Yeah. You know? and, and we think that's a good thing. And we think that it sort of shows and demonstrates how important we are as a person because we're so busy. Um, but truthfully, what, the busier you are, um, what you're doing is you are taking the space uh, of when synchronicities could happen, but those synchronicities, synchronicities aren't going to happen because your life is so filled with other things. So, and, and the irony is when you create some space, that actually leaves room for the things that you really want to be able to move in. This is counterintuitive. So uh, it's kind of why some of the productivity gurus, again, like the Tim Ferrisses of the world, tell you that it's really important to learn how to say no <laughs> to things. I mean, of course, when you're young more often, or you're junior at things more, more often than not, you're going to say yes, because when, when you're young, sort of these more low-level opportunities that will get you ahead. <laughs> you know, so when you're younger, it, it, it is good to say yes more often. But at a certain point, saying yes has diminish, diminishing returns when you really find out that all of your time is starting to get used up. If you say no, <laughs> then it gives you the ability to prioritize. <laughs> because if you don't actually have that space and you're not consciously deciding what you're saying yes and no to, then you're basically just letting external circumstances run your life, right? So this is why one of the most sensible things you can do is just say no and create some space. Now, the next thing that you need to do is you need to pay attention to what you're curious about. You know, it's not so much that you go looking for the thing you're supposed to be doing, but no, you just listen to the universe. And at a certain point, you're just curious. You're interested in something. You know, there's just a thing. It, it grabbed your attention. You don't really know why, <laughs> but, um, but it's just something that maybe you need to investigate, right? So uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, uh, she is a really amazing author. Uh, she wrote uh, Eat, Pray, Love, which is a really great book, but she also wrote the book Big Magic, which uh, similar to The Artist's Way is a book about creativity. She also has a, uh, a podcast uh, that she created uh, with Ted, and she, does, she tells a story. And in this story, uh, it basically started with uh, her wanting to try gardening. There was really no rational reason for it. She was just a bit curious about gardening. Okay, <laughs> you know, could be. So she, she got a small plot of land uh, near her house, and once she started gardening, she got interested in some of the plants that were in her garden. So she did a bit of uh, research on the plants, and that led her to the history of these plants. And it turns out that a lot of these plants were cultivated in the 19th century in botanical gardens. So she read up a bit on these botanical gardens uh, back in the 19th century, and she found out that back in those days, there were severe gender issues uh, that the botanists, uh, particularly the female botanists, uh, had to deal with when dealing with their, uh, their male colleagues. And then at that point, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, she traveled to investigate all of this some more. And she went to Tahiti. And she went, she went to Amsterdam <laughs> to be able to study in Hort Hortus Botanicus, right? And then ultimately, all of this led to her book, The Signature of All Things, which is a book about a 19th century female botanist. And this entire process took three years. So that's the thing. <laughs> Creativity is a scavenger hunt. Entrepreneurship is a similar scavenger hunt. Here's the thing. We want to always be able to predict things in advance. <laughs> we want to write a business plan. 
right? <laughs> you know, and be able to predict in copious amounts of detail exactly what I'm going to do, right? And we have a, a, a one-year plan and a two-year plan and a five-year plan and a 10-year plan. If you ask me, business plans suck, <laughs> really, <laughs> you know? I mean, what we actually need is just more to think about, you know, what am I going to do next? Because any kind of long-term plan, in my opinion, is a complete lack of creativity, <laughs> you know? And it's also not going to help you because we as people are not able to predict that far in advance. Who knows what we're going to be doing in 10 years and who knows what the market is going to look like in 10 years. That's precisely the reason why business methodology is like the lean startup exists. <laughs> it's because it's about not knowing what the future is going to hold. And it's about creating minimum viable products, you know, doing collecting validated learning to see if our tiny idea actually was, was a good idea and has any product market fit whatsoever, you know, pivoting to follow the pain in the market and then rapidly iterating. You know, that's not a 10-year plan. That's not even a three-year plan or a one-year plan. That is literally just trying, try and experiment, change, modify it. Try, try and experiment again, modify it. Repeat, repeat, repeat. It's the same thing with software, right? <laughs> you know, it's like like agile for software development, right? Daily standups, two-week sprints, uh, <laughs> you know, and even tech people have taken that one step further with DevOps. I mean, that's like, a thousand deploys a day. We've learned that big, complex things can be built by taking very small steps and rapidly iterating. So then the question is, why would that be any different for business? It's not. So anyhow, um, I so we're at the end of the class now, so I'm going to uh, stop my screen share. Um, I hope that you found this class to be thought provoking and interesting. This is definitely not the typical kind of material uh, that you're going to be um, receiving in most of your classes uh, in your in the business program. But this is precisely the reason why, you know, why you need uh, to be hearing it.